Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Gali Anastasi, and a blessed resurrection of our souls. This is precisely what a graffiti artist wrote around Athens, Greece, a few days ago, paraphrasing the verse of our creed, I await the resurrection of the dead. Instead, he wrote, I await the resurrection of the living. This is highly prophetic, because many of our souls, having been stooped in a state of slumber, are now beginning to resurrect. This coronavirus is not the soldier of Allah to kill the enemies of Islam, as some misguided Islamist cleric was preaching a few days ago, but a lofty sermon of repentance and a great wake-up call to remind us the sermon of Solomon that all earthly things are vanity because they have an expiration date. The Sermon of Noah, to help us enter the ark, to seek the mystical life of the church. The Sermon of God, the Logos, to Lot's wife, do not look back and do not have sinful loves in your heart because they will turn your heart into stone. But the greatest sermon of all missed by most of our contemporaries who are deathly afraid of this strange epidemic called coronavirus is the destruction of death by our Savior. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. He shall live with his soul in paradise, and after the common resurrection, after the general resurrection confirmed and assured by the resurrection of Lazarus, soul and body will unite and live eternally in the kingdom of God. Isn't this the message we hear every Paschal liturgy? Death, where is your sting? And St. John the Chrysostom thunders, Let no one be afraid of death, for we were freed by the Savior's death. Today, however, we are afraid of death because fear is the opposite of the love for God. Perfect love casts out all fear, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of the many, of the majority of the Christians, will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Our Lord left us with a vast number of prophecies to help us discern the times. But how can we do this? We are not all prophets. We are not all prophets in the narrow sense of the word, according to St. Paul. We are not all prophets. We are not all teachers or miracle workers. And besides, Christ himself warned us repeatedly about false prophets and false Christs towards the end times, or during the end times. Yet we need to understand that the gift of prophecy will always be in the church, but we must not limit the prophetic gift in foretelling and pinpointing some events in the distant future. The niptic Christian, the vigilant Christian, who is nurtured with the spirit of the church fathers and saintly elders, can also develop a prophetic eye and will be able to see many things that the average nominal Christian will not be able to see. St. Andrew of Caesarea gives us the key. Time and experience will reveal these things to the vigilant. Our recent elders, who were much more vigilant than all of us and had a very pure heart, have left us with a plethora of prophetic sermons now circulating on the web to help us repent and to safeguard us from the great deception that will overtake the entire earth. The great temptation orchestrated for decades now is to dechristianize the heart of the Christians, to destroy our faith in the divinity of Christ, and to prepare us for the acceptance of the lawless one, the men of lawlessness, who will legislate sin and perversion into the law of the land. These prophetic sermons are necessary and very important, but we must also have the proper spiritual ears. In the seven churches of the book of the Revelation, the resurrected and glorified Christ finishes every one of the epistles with the same epilogue, let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. 
So the Holy Spirit speaks to every Christian who humbly works out his salvation and approaches the holy mysteries with fear and trembling. The Lord revealed to St. John the present spiritual condition of every bishop in the seven churches. He revealed to him the things that are and the things that must take place thereafter. So we have prophecy that reveals things of the future. We have prophecy that reveals the present and prophecy that reveals the past. St. John the baptizer was a prophet of the present. He simply pointed out and said, this is the Messiah. That was the prophecy of St. John. It was prophetic, but it was a prophecy of the present. Moses was a prophet of the past, of the present, and of the future. Because when he wrote Genesis, he was revealed things that took place thousands of years before. He certainly prophesied the present, and he saw the world of God as he was taking his people through the wilderness. And he also revealed many prophecies of the future, conditional and unconditional. This may sound like a novel concept to some, but not all prophecies are absolute or cut in stone. Most of them are. Christ said, the heaven and the earth will pass away, but my words by no means will pass away. Prophecies of the first and second presence of Christ, the incarnation of the crucifixion, the resurrection and ascension, which make up our creed of faith, are absolute and more truthful than the very existence of the sky and of the earth. These prophecies make up the doctrine of our church and they cement our faith. Such are the prophecies of the Messianic Psalms, which our church includes in the royal hours of the Nativity, Epiphany, Pascha, and in the Vespers of Holy Ascension, Holy Pentecost, and Holy Transfiguration. Some of these prophecies are fulfilled at a certain time and place. Some other prophecies repeat themselves throughout history and with a higher intensity as we approach the end times. The prophecy of Pentecost recorded by prophet Joel in the Old Testament took place at 33 AD. It will not be repeated again regardless of what the heresy of the pseudo-Pentecostals may claim. They claim that a second Pentecost took place a couple hundred years ago and that same evil spirit behind this falsehood introduced the catastrophic prophecy of a pre-tribulation rapture. Pre-tribulation rapture is a false prophecy because it introduces an additional coming of Christ, something totally opposed to the scriptures. Another example is the prophecy of the four symbolic courses of revelation, which are interpreted by the cyclical theory. They will continue to come out until the end of history. So we're not going to see a green horse somewhere in Egypt as someone posted a few years ago. This, this is all symbolic language and we need to know the mind of the church fathers before we can begin to delve into prophecy interpretation. So these four horses are simply symbolic of wars, famine, disease, death, which will plague the planet more and more as the gospel is being denied and lawlessness increases. So we have the absolute prophecies which are connected to the doctrinal backbone of the church and solidify our faith. But we also have another category of prophecies connected to the spiritual law. In our recent lecture, we spoke about the power of free will. Lot's wife looked back and disobeyed God while God was holding her hand. So this is how powerful the free will is in us. Free will is an inalienable characteristic of the image of God in us. We are created free to choose our destiny. These prophecies or mandates are given to help us avoid their disastrous fulfillment by leading us to repentance. Here's an example of a prophecy connected to the spiritual law. Christ told Apostle Peter, He who lives with the sword will die by the sword. The person 
who does not love God will feel threatened by his neighbor and will amass all kinds of weapons to destroy his fellow man and or to take the land and possessions of his neighbor by force. This is how leaders of nations understand peace nowadays. If you want peace, become prepared for war. And with this prevailing ideology, dozens of nations now have the nuclear arsenals to make life extinct on this planet. Those who live with a sword will perish by the sword, and hence the prophecy of Armageddon. For the lack of a better term, we will name these prophecies conditional prophecies. And so you don't think that I am improvising here. I will quote the teachings of Metropolitan Neophytos of Morphu in Cyprus, and I'm quoting from a very short video dated January 28th, where he says, Saint Paisius appeared to one of his spiritual children, and he was very happy. And one asked, Yolanda, why are you so happy? Why are you so cheerful? Because the Panagia was happy when she appeared to me and told me that there are still people who repent and a lot less will take place from the things that we said and prophesied. This is a very important key of understanding this type of conditional prophecies. And then the same Metropolitan quoted our Yeranda, our holy elder Ephraim of Arizona, whom he reveres greatly. The elder told him a few years ago, and I quote the Metropolitan, he says, Yeranda Ephraim spoke about two different scenarios. The one scenario calls for vast destruction worldwide, not from wars only, but from geophysical phenomena and all these because of our sins. The second scenario is that the destruction could be greatly reduced if heaven sees that there are people who repent." End of quote. So the remnant can accomplish quite a lot if we keep in mind that God's philanthropy and his love for Abraham was ready to reverse the fate of Sodom if Abraham could find him ten godly people in the Pentapolis of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Holy One of Morphu knew Saint Porphyrios very well, and he said something that I heard from other sources in the last few days. On this same video, he mentioned that Saint Porphyrios was openly teaching that a prophecy is given so its fulfillment can be avoided. Imagine that! Then what kind of prophecy is it? Precisely some of these prophecies that many of our brothers and sisters write books about, and waste untold hours on social media with unfriendly debates because they treat these prophecies as absolute and cut in stone. These are conditional prophecies, my friends, that can be fulfilled or abolished, lengthened, shortened, increased, and decreased depending on the level of our repentance. As this very pious bishop says, God's philanthropy prefers to have his prophet exposed and proven wrong if and when the given prophecy moves people to repentance. This could not be easily understood by prophet Jonah, who complained to God. He refused to go to Nineveh to preach that God will destroy the city in three days. Jonah thought very rationally, like a lot of us. I will tell these people there were about 600,000 people in the city of Nineveh and about 120,000 small children. And he says, I will go and tell them God will destroy you in three days. And because God is merciful, he will change his mind if they repent, and then I will be looked upon as a false prophet. So he headed to Spain instead of Nineveh. Well, you know the story. The fact remains that this prophecy was not fulfilled because of people's repentance at least for the time being. A few generations later, during the time of Tobit, Nineveh was totally destroyed because Nineveh's citizens returned to their wicked ways. So the main purpose of prophecy is to keep us vigilant, to strengthen our faith, to be obedient to the commandments, but also to keep us repenting, to keep repenting daily, to strengthen our faith so we can continue to work out our salvation. So we will study the signs, we'll be informed, but our main task is to remain united with Christ and His Church through worship 
unceasing prayer, unceasing memory of God, studying of the scriptures and the lives of the saints, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. If we find ourselves being consumed and spending most of our time on social media debating which elder is more correct about some of these prophecies and begin to insult each other, then we have missed the mark. Some contemporary elders in Russia and other places have spoken about some geographical changes and the resurgence of some Orthodox Christian political leaders reminiscent of the golden years of Christianity, like Constantine the Great and some of the great Christian emperors and the Tsars of Russia. We don't discount these, but we simply include them in the area of conditional prophecies. Did we not see such a small resurgence in the Soviet Union in the last 30 years? After 70 years of dreadful persecution where the false church of the humanist bishops became the harlot riding the red beast, the prayers of the martyrs and saints broke the chains of Satan and freed the church from one of its greatest persecutions. The Soviet martyrs of last century surpassed the number of the martyrs of the first three centuries of the church. Up to 20 million lay people decorated heaven and over a hundred thousand clerics. No wonder a number of writers today refer to Putin as the czar. Because at the moment, I don't know the man, I don't know his heart, but at the moment there are more churches being built in Russia than any other country in the world. As the orthodox spirituality of a nation increases, God will bless the nation with more wise and pious leaders, and vice versa. In the country of Greece, where we have excelled in the area of sin and lawlessness in the last 30 years, we have been doomed by atheistic, Masonic, and highly anti-Christian governments. They have managed to remove our icons and crosses from the classroom, remove the subject of Orthodox religious education from the schools. They have taken 95% of the church's property, and now they closed every church and chapel at the command of their European loan officers. What can reverse all this? If the synod of the 70 bishops declares the church in a state of persecution and invite all people, all faithful, to begin Holy Week, with a three-day total fast for those who are able and healthy. So the repentance mentioned by the Holy One of Morphu is adequate to keep us from total destruction, but not adequate to reward us with a decade of peace and prosperity. Peace and prosperity without repentance is catastrophic according to St. John the Chrysostom. We saw what the years of the seven fat cows in the late 80s and 90s did for the Orthodox country of Greece. Today, April 1st, our church commemorates one of the most powerful examples of repentance, proving the great power of our Orthodox faith. Our Holy Church has such power from God that it can take the greatest prostitute of the 6th century in Egypt and transform her into one of the greatest saints of our church. We celebrate her memory on April 1st, but our church also puts her on the pedestal every fifth Sunday of Great Lent to show us what man can do when he surrenders his entire life to God. When we commit ourselves and one another and our entire life to Christ our God, things change. Now, we cannot all run to the desert, at least not yet, although things do not look very promising around us. We are being bombarded on a daily basis by video after video, theory after theory, about the perpetrators behind this so-called pandemic. Videos about the enforcement of the New World Order, Big Pharma and the implementation of forced vaccinations, the radiation of 5G technology, population reduction, and the dawning of the one world government. All these things can really trouble us if we don't stay focused. We don't discount any of the above, but we also need to know that none of this will take place without God's permission. To answer some of the questions coming in, no, we, we don't know if the Antichrist is born yet. We have no way of knowing that. 
We don't know if the Antichrist is born because it's connected to the second coming of Christ. And because the second coming of Christ is unknown, the presence of the Antichrist is also unknown for the time being. We don't know yet if vaccinations will be forced. We don't know if they will be closing our churches every time there is a pandemic, although this is not a very good precedent. We must remain patient and use our greatest spiritual weapons during these perilous days, prayer and serious fasting for those with the gift of health. With us being vigilant and prayerful, God's will will be revealed to us and to the body of his church. May the Lord and the Panagia have mercy on us as we approach a very different Holy Week and Pascha.